I'm Sonia Nolan, and around my warm table, we will welcome an eclectic and fabulous range of guests to share their expert knowledge and life experiences. In this first season, we are exploring a wide range of topics, including some of those we were taught not to discuss at the table, politics, religion, and sex. The table is set. Please join us. Today on My Warm Table, we are talking religion. I have the pleasure of speaking with Sister Anne Tormey, a Catholic nun from the Sisters of Mercy congregation. Sister Anne has been a Sister of Mercy for 60 years, devoting her life to the complexities of social justice issues such as modern day slavery and human trafficking. She's also a great reader, thinker, empathiser and encourager of the human spirit. I first met Sister Anne 15 years ago as a participant of the Catherine McCauley Developing Women in Leadership and Service Scholarship Award. It was a program that she founded with Sister Sheila Saul to develop the women who they believed would take the mission of God's teachings forward for a new era. I'm sure those who know Sister Anne will delight through this interview in hearing her voice of calm and wisdom again. She shares her many reflections on the great mystics of centuries past who offer us windows of truth where we can find meaning and stillness in today's busy and often troubled world. Sister Anne, it's just such a privilege and a pleasure to be talking with you today and there's so much I want to ask you and there's so many things I want to cover with you today. And it's lovely for me to be here with you, Sonia. I have just completed 60 years this year as a member of the Sisters of Mercy and I've seen more recently a lot of the institutions that the Sisters religious congregations across Australia established to meet the needs of another age um, for education, for health, for social services in various forms. These institutions have in the main now been passed into other hands. The sisters now, uh, the communities are principally composed of aged women. And I feel very privileged to live with uh, women, many of them very frail, who live with great generosity of spirit and who live very rich lives and have great spiritual depth. So I feel very blessed. Do you mind if we dive back into 60 years ago when you joined the convent Mm -hmm. what was life like then and what was the convent like then for you I think 60 years ago like the world I grew up in was sort of a post-war world when there was nobody was very affluent and life was quite simple in lots of ways do you know Um, but I joined the sisters before completing my degree, um, and it was uh, very much a sort of semi-enclosed uh, community, which was not what our foundress envisaged, but it was the way things had evolved in the church. And I joined just before the Vatican Council, and I remember the sort of thrill I had when I heard the church had written a document, a document on the church in the modern world. I was really very excited about that. And then at the same time, I discovered Taya de Chardin. Uh, Taya de Chardin uh, was a French priest, a scientist, but who had this great sense of, well, of evolution was one, but uh, he was a geologist too, you know, and it was just a different vision of reality and of the interconnection of everything. But then life changed. The sisters were very quick. Religious congregations of women to start to uh, apply the learnings of Vatican II, the teachings. And so our ministries began to diversify. We had lots of opportunities for religious, deeper religious formation and for study and also for travel. So you've seen a lot of change. The sisters were quick to start uh, living the ministry and of the founders you you mentioned. And I live with a community at the moment of women who do quite incredible things. Many of them spent years living in uh, PNG or in Pakistan. Um, Many of them live with Aboriginal communities in different parts of Australia. I know that you've done some work over many years in the area of human trafficking. Slavery, 
we thought was finished in the 19th century, but there are probably more people enslaved now than there have ever been. And there are also people in every country working to counter human trafficking and human slavery. There's actually been some really positive developments in that with legislation passed even That's here right. in West in Australia about um, supply chains, where That's you right. have to actually look through your supply chain all the way through to make sure that there isn't any slavery involved at any stage. So, And because it's such a real issue in our in our modern world. And there's still more to be done mm. in terms of legislation and enforcement of for contravening. I know that there's another sister that you are close with who has dedicated a lot of her life to the eradication of landmines. Yes, she was very involved in forms of social justice and one time was heavily involved in the uh, landmines cam- anti-landmines campaign, I should say, within Australia. I think it was in Ottawa for the signing of the landmines agreement. She was back and forth to Geneva. But it's, yes, and the sisters were involved in lots of um, social justice activities and still are. And I think that's something that always, in my mind, marked the Sisters of Mercy con- as a congregation or as a, as a mission was very active in contemporary um, issues. And wherever the need was, that is where the Sisters of Mercy would be found. And we we move to today's world and, and it is, you know, the issues are really big and complex, but you still see the Sisters of Mercy within that discussion and the activity to help the world be a better place. I think the religious congregations of sisters have contributed in their own way. Um, But it's not just the sisters, it's all people. You know, I think the future of the church, I often think, is with lay people like yourself. We all stand on the shoulders of those who went before us. We can learn from them, but it's, it's the people of goodwill everywhere. Well, there are lots of problems in our society, there is also a lot of generosity, people who are so concerned for other people. So you talk about the if this is like the end of an era for the work of the Sisters of Mercy as it has been in the past. So can you tell me more about that? I, th- I think in terms of their institutional commitment, there has been a great deal of, uh, s- certainly since the Vatican Council, communities diversified in their ministry and did many different things. But I think th- the life of communities in the life of the church goes in cycles and groups come into being to meet specific needs. Many of them uh, then at a later point go out of existence and other groups, some continue, redo themselves and continue on, but the majority seem to uh, have an ending point and then other groups emerge to meet the needs of a different age. And so where do you think this next age is taking us in regards to how will we meet these needs and, and what are the needs? That I, have? I have no idea Um like it's a great mystery, life is a great mystery. Uh, But I have great faith that the message goes on. I think we live in quite uncertain times. I think the pandemic, of course, but we also live in times of great geopolitical tension. Um, We live in times of enormous social economic inequality, certainly between countries but also within countries. We live at a time where there's a great crisis of meaning for many people, people searching. And I think and people live very busy lives. I think so many of them are searching for meaning, are searching for inner peace. How do you see people finding that meaning these days? I think people search in many different ways. I think in the past, the great religious traditions into which people were incorporated, from that they gained a sense of what life's purpose was in life. At the present time, in in a very um, secular age, in many very highly individualistic societies, I think the search for meaning takes on different forms. But you do see it. People in the end come that life must be more than trying to make money and have success and have a lot of possessions. You can have all those and still not be a happy person. But people search in different ways. 
<clears throat> but I do notice uh, some evidence of the searching is the emphasis for many people on forms of meditation, practicing yoga and tai chi, other people, form different forms of meditation, people going on retreats of one form or another, people going on pilgrimages, opening to spiritual texts, whether they be the poet Rumi, the Sufi mystic Rumi, whether they be... Uh, some of the spiritual writers, contemporary spiritual writers, such as Eckhart Tolle, renowned writers such as Thomas Merton, C.S. Lewis. People search in different forms. And there is so much wisdom for us to tap into. It is at our fingertips if we go looking for it. So I think that's a, a really lovely message that you've reminded me of these wonderful writers and um, some of the mystics, what it is that they were finding or how they were finding that stillness and peace. Well, certainly there's been a revival in the interest in uh, the medieval mystics as well, people such as Meister Eckhart, but also the women, you know, Hildegard of Bingen, Quite often you can listen to Hildegard's music on the ABC. Uh, the interest in uh, people such as MacTilde of Magdeburg, Julian of Norwich, and their genius has often been overlooked. But these women were emphasising the importance of union with God. They came to it through revelations and inspiration, and it was their connection with, with God. This incredible sense of the awesomeness and the wonder and the, the beauty of God. And I often think uh, of Julian of Norwich because this particular interest because of her message of hope, her message that we are all loved by God, um, that we're held in God is our maker, our keeper and our lover. We cannot not be loved by God. And that in spite of, and I think it's a great message of hope because a lot of people have a very poor sense of themselves. And I think the message here is there's no anger in God, that in spite of what people do or omit to do, God doesn't blame us, that in the end, in spite of the um, suffering we may cause ourselves, that everything will be all right that all will be well. Those words, all shall be well and all shall be well and all manner of all things shall be extremely well, I think she said in the end. And and that has been something that um, has certainly stayed with me. I remember during the Catherine McCauley course, I think someone gave that to me in a little slip of paper that I've carried around in my purse for many years now and have shared that same message of hope and um, promise with others along That's, the way. Of course, she was... She lived at a time of great social upheaval in England and she's regarded as one of the first uh, of the English writers. Is that the 12th century or the 13th century? Uh, really the, um, uh, the 13th and the 14th century, yes. a time of certainly the Black Death where about half of the population in Europe anyway died. Uh, it was the time of the Hundred Years' War with France, the time of the Peasant Revolt. So in Norwich, there was a great deal that went on around her. And she prayed herself for three graces to have the experience of being sick unto death and not dying, of having experience of the passion of Christ, and then of being gifted with the grace of contrition, compassion and deep longing for God. And she did have 16 revelations when she was in that state of being sick unto death, 16 revelations of God's love over a period of uh, two days. But then for 20 years she reflected and meditated on that experience and then um, her text, The Revelations of Divine Love, emerged. It was lost for a long time and then later recovered and now it's, it's quite popular because in it it's that emphasis on the love of God. And other things, the importance of prayer, of trust, but of trusting God. She also speaks of God in terms of the motherhood of God. That's something that really struck me throughout our um, conversations through the Catherine McCauley Award, that the presence of God 
is seen as both masculine and feminine and there was a very much a nurturing understanding of of God and Jesus as our mother as well as our our father and again finding the role of women in the church or in ministry or in the transmission of a message that having that powerful um, vision of the motherhood of Christianity being equally and important in um in how we move forward and how we understand ourselves and understand christianity for many people god is imaged as masculine because of the persistent use of masculine images but in actual fact god is beyond gender and god is holy mystery so for julian god is our mother because god is our maker uh, Julian emphasizes too the importance of coming to know oneself as well as to know God and the two need to go on so coming to know weakness and fragility as well as our, our strength. What I find interesting is that Julian Norwich had her experience in the 1200s, the 1300s, and she was in England. And then we had Catherine of Siena, another mystic, a different time and in a different place. And she came to the same conclusions. So there's got to be something in all of this, right? (laughs) Catherine of Siena says, Be who God meant you to be and you will set the world on fire. Proclaim the truth and do not be silent through fear. And God is closer to us than water is to fish. So very similar sort of understanding that she came to through her own contemplation at that um, in, in a you know different time, mm-hmm. different place. That is, is a constant recurring theme of the mystic. I think it is. And why do you talk about desire? And of course, um, Julian's on about longing, uh, longing for God, God's longing for us, our desire for God. But you just in mentioning that, you evoked my... A recollection of um, Augustine, there are many sides to Augustine, but he he was certainly um, a great exponent of desire, and he would say, God is closer to us than we are to our own hearts. You know, He also speaks of the restlessness, you know, we are restless until we rest in thee. But I think it's that inner experience of God in a much more contemporary um, example of that is Eddie Hillison. And Etty was a young Jewish woman who lived um, during the Second World War in Amsterdam. Uh, she wasn't a practicing Jew in terms of the faith, but her diary, the diary of Etty Hillesum, is quite an amazing text because we trace the journey of this very young woman, woman her growth in self-knowledge and her growth in awareness of God within her and her, uh, her dialogue with God as she becomes more aware of the, well, of the tragedy for her own people. <clears throat> and then more aware too as she goes with uh, a lot of women and children to the, the camp at Westerbork where they await um, transport to the concentration camps. And Eddie herself will die in Auschwitz. In her experience, she commits to writing and her growth and the influence, the influ- her earlier influence of um, poets such as Rilke and the Russian novelists. And then to her relationship with Julian Spears, who was really a Jungian analyst. So she comes to greater self-knowledge, but greater awareness of God. And of the need, as she says, to be we need to be helping you, God. And I think that's another emphasis on uh, the mystics is life is not about ourselves. Life is about um, transcending ourselves in the love of other people. So Julian will write for her fellow Christians to give some of these insights to them. Uh, Eddie will be there helping of helping people in time of great despair and trouble, women and children, you know, in the camps. And I just think at the moment of all the women and children leaving the Ukraine, you know, the immense amount of human misery and the need people have for the compassion of other people.
It's time for us to practice some of the stillness we've been talking about. Relevant to today's world is that St. Julian of Norwich is the patron saint of the anxious. So I invite you to stop for the next few minutes and meditate to Sister Anne's reflections on the contemplations of this mystic. You'll also hear the extraordinary 11th century composition of German-born mystic St. Hildegard von Bingen. The main message of Julian of Norwich's revelations of divine love is that God is love, that God's infinite gentleness and mercy and love for all people is unchanging, that God's tender love surrounds us and will never leave us. She also emphasises that God's goodness is reflected in the goodness of creation and that God rejoices in creation. And there's that little um, example she gives of uh, God showed me in my palm a little thing round as a ball about the size of a hazelnut. And I looked at it with the eye of my understanding and asked myself, what is this thing? And I was answered, it is everything that is created. I wondered how it could survive, since it seemed so little it could suddenly disintegrate into nothing. The answer came, it endures and ever will endure because God loves it. And so everything has being because of God's love. She also says because of our blindness and ignorance we, we can't see God unless God reveals God's self. So we need to seek God, but our seeking is God's gift to us. And she saw no anger in God. God died to save us from ourselves. And when we fail, we are never less in God's love. God's love is beyond measure. It is eternal and can never be lost. And what's quite striking in um, Julian is she invokes the motherhood of God and of Christ. God feels great delight to be our father and God feels great delight to be our mother. Jesus is our mother from whom we are endlessly born and from whom we will never be separated. We are enclosed in him and he is enclosed in us. Christ reveals his motherhood through endless compassion towards our failings and fears. And our response is to respond with the trust of a child. She emphasizes that prayer is a relationship with God and our longing for God, our desire for God, reflects God's longing and desire for us and within us. Its purpose is so that we might become one with God so we should entreat vehemently, wisely and sincerely to be made one with God's desire. We should pray with thanksgiving and trust, and in meditating and in trusting in God's love, we are transformed. Through her experience, she was led from a focus on herself to deep care for her fellow Christians. Her message is that no matter what sufferings we undergo, as a result of our own sinfulness, all manner of things will be well. She says elsewhere, God did not say, you will never have a rough passage, you will never be overstrained, you will never feel uncomfortable. But God did say, you will never be overcome. So God wants us to pay attention to these words, so as to trust him always with strong confidence for he loves us and delights in us. So he wills that we should love and delight in him in return and trust him with all our strength, so all will be well.
Speaking with Sister Anne Tormey and gleaning her wisdom has been a true privilege for me. It's been a timely reminder of how loved we are and the need to stop and literally smell the roses and appreciate that the beauty and preciousness of creation and our Creator is all around us. Let's keep the conversation flowing. Please subscribe to the My Warm Table podcast and share it with your friends and networks. Perhaps if they are new to podcasting, take a moment to show them how to download and subscribe so they don't miss an episode either. I'd also love you to join our community on Facebook. You'll find the group at My Warm Table Podcast. Your support is very much appreciated. Until next time, shine bright, be kind, and remember that great movements and positive change often begin with ideas shared around a warm table.